we've seen some very basic tactics for doing proof so far, simple and reflexivity. Let's look at a new tactic, rewrite. So suppose we were trying to prove that for every natural number n and m, if those are the same natural number, if n equals m, then it is the case that adding them together is also the same. So n plus n equals m plus m. A toy example to be sure, but it will work for us. OK, so notice that we have logical implications showing up here, perhaps for the first time. Uh, it is written with the same syntax that we wrote the function arrow type for. So that's uh, uh, hyphen greater than. That becomes that prettified version as a single right arrow. So n equals m implies, think of this as the implies operator from mathematical logic, n plus n equals m plus m. All right. So let's get started with that proof. Uh, we have two variables being quantified here, and we can introduce both of, both of them. Now you could do that with two separate intro statements. You could do intros n, intros m together. So Emacs inconveniently reorganized my screen there. OK, intros n, intros m. That would work just fine. So if we do one of them, we would get n above the line. We would get rid of the universal quantifier for n below. And we could do m. But as a little simplification, make this a little nicer, you can actually do them sequentially right there in a row, both at the same time, and they both have type nat. OK. Now what about this n equals m here? That's a kind of assumption that we've got going on here in this theorem. Uh, sometime, sometimes people call this the antecedent. So what's on the left is the antecedent of, of that arrow. What's on the right is the consequent. So the antecedent, or the assumption, or the hypothesis. This is a hypothesis that we have about n and m. We'll move that into the context. In Koch vocabulary, in fact, we often use the word hypothesis to talk about something that's on the left-hand side of an arrow or anything that's above this line as an assumption that we're making in the proof, a hypothesis that we have for the proof. So we'll move that into the context using the same tactic, intros, and we'll give it the name h. Watch what happens. That moves that that assumption, that antecedent from the left-hand side of the arrow up above the line. We now have recorded that n equals m, and we've given that assumption, that hypothesis, a name. We chose h here. OK. So using that hypothesis, what could we conclude? Well, think about it if you were doing the proof on paper. You might say, well, since n equals m, I could replace both of these n's below the line with m. OK. There is a tactic to do exactly that kind of mental reasoning, but to tell Koch to do it, and that is the rewrite tactic. Rewrite here is, is taking two kind of arguments or pieces of information you want. Uh, one of them is the hypothesis we want to use to do the rewrite. So that hypothesis needs to be of the form something equals something else. And rewrite then is going to replace one of them with the other. But which direction should it do? Should it replace the left-hand side with the right or the right-hand side with the left? That is what this arrow here is showing. It's showing we want to rewrite kind of going from left to right. So replace whatever is on the left hand side here with what's on the right. So we'll replace n with m anywhere n shows up down here in the goal. OK, so if I step through that, voila, now we have m plus m equals m plus m, right? We replaced those n's. We rewrote them to be m. OK, and now that we have m plus m equals m plus m, in fact, that's something that reflexivity is good enough to show. And so we're done, QED. All right, so that's our first use of rewrite there. Uh, rewrite needed to know which equality is being used. That's why we had to name it there. And it needed to know the direction in which to do the replacement, which is why we provided that right arrow. Okay, some of this can be relaxed, as we'll see later. As we used it in the previous example, we rewrote with a hypothesis that was part of the theorem being proved. You can also do rewrites with standard library theorems or theorems you've proved yourself. Let's see an example of that. Remember the check command? It can tell us what the type of something is. Well, here's a standard library theorem, mult n o. You can maybe already even guess what that theorem is for based on the naming conventions we've started to establish. It's probably something to do about uh, what happens when you multiply n by 0, and the 0 is on the right-hand side. OK, so in fact, when you check it, you'll see that. Uh, that is a theorem in the standard library that shows that for all natural numbers n, 0 equals n times 0. Great. 
Uh, here's another one from the standard library. Uh, if you, for all natural numbers n and m, this one's a little more complicated. Uh, let's look at the right-hand side first. n times the successor of m. So n times 1 plus m. Uh, what does that get you? Well, if you do the algebra, of course, you've got uh, n times m and then uh, another n in there as well. So that equals n times m plus n. So mult n SM. Again, the mnemonic there is you've got n there and the successor of m there as part of the theorem that you've proved. Okay, so that gets a way of, of doing a little bit of algebra for us. We're going to use something like this in our next example. Okay, uh, let's dive into it. So what are we trying to prove here? Uh, we've got two natural numbers, p and q. This is actually much better than n and m, isn't it? It's much, it's easier to hear the difference between p and q, perhaps. Okay, if you have p times zero and add q times zero to that, you're gonna get zero. Again, a toy example, but it'll show us how to work with rewrites. All right, well, we've got a universal quantifier starting this off. So let's introduce both of the variables that it quantifies. p and q are now above the line. We know that they are natural numbers. Okay. Well, let's make use of one of those previously proved theorems. We know that p times zero is in fact zero. That's what this theorem showed, mult n zero up here. Uh, but of course, there we wanna rewrite it going from right to left. We have a p times zero here. We'd like to replace that by zero. And that's going from the right-hand side of that equality to the left hand. So we wanna rewrite something to the form n times zero into just zero. Now notice this universally quantified over that natural number there. It could be any natural number. So it's perfectly fine to instantiate that uh, with the particular but unknown natural number q, uh, p that we have here. All right, so let's put all that together. We want to use the rewrite tactic. We want to rewrite from right to left. So we use an arrow going that direction here, which is really just the prettified version of less than dash or hyphen. And the equality we want to use to do the rewrite is mult no from the standard library. When we do that, that got replaced there. Now we don't just have p times zero, we have simply zero. Okay, let's pull that same trick again. Let's replace the q times zero with just zero. Great, we've succeeded in that. And now we have zero plus zero. Reflexivity suffices to prove that. And we're done with the proof. Rewrite is going to be a very important tactic for us. Uh, anytime we're dealing with equalities, it's something that could come into play. Uh, but do notice, and this is something that maybe trips people up when they're first starting, uh, it is a tactic that's only really applicable when you have equalities or relations anyway that behave like equalities around. Um, so you don't want to use the rewrite tactic in, unless you do really have some sort of notion of equality that you're trying to manipulate, replace one side of with the other. Uh, sometimes people call that Leibniz equality uh, for the famous mathematician Leibniz, uh, the notion that you can replace equals for equals. That is the mental notion of proof technique that the rewrite tactic is implementing in Koch. Uh, 